Hi everyone, I'm Daisy Escoto, Kidney Care Manager with the Northern Alberta Branch of the Kidney Foundation. We'll be discussing managing fatigue with kidney disease during this portion of the patient forum. And I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Janine Farragher and Nancy Verdon. Nancy has been a kidney patient for 33 years. She was diagnosed very suddenly with kidney failure and a crash start on dialysis was a harsh way to meet her new reality. Her experience as an occupational therapist was instrumental in helping her learn to cope with the fatigue that is such a large part of chronic illness. Through trial and error, she was able to gradually return to full-time work and continued her love of curling and outdoor activities. She also learned to let people into her experience and build a support network that has sustained her through all the great times and the crises that living with kidney failure can bring. She lives alone with her two cats and is eager to return to her volunteer work as a caring clown, visiting patients in hospital and bringing a light spot to their day. Dr. Janine Farragher is an assistant professor from the Department of Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy at the University of Toronto. She holds a PhD in Rehabilitation Sciences and completed her post or postdoctoral training at the University of Calgary's Cummings School of, Science, of Medicine via the Kidney Research Scientist Core Education and National Training Program. Janine's research is focused on developing and testing self-management interventions to enable people with chronic kidney disease to fully participate in life. She led the development and testing of a web-based program to promote fatigue management in people receiving hemodialysis and is also interested in cognitive, psychosocial, and environmental factors that can impact life participation in people living with chronic kidney disease. Perfect. Thank you so much for the introduction, Daisy. I hope everybody can hear me. I'm just going to assume everybody can, unless you give me a signal that you can't. <laughs> so uh, as Daisy mentioned, my name is uh, Janine Farragher. It is an absolute pleasure to be joining you all today. I think this is a really cool opportunity for all of us to connect. And, um, and so I'm really happy to be here. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm joined by Nancy Verdon. Nancy, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, a great big thank you for including me that this is a very exciting moment to actually have that opportunity to share skills that I speak from experience really made a difference in how I live and cope with kidney disease. And hopefully you'll be able to take away some great information with this. Yeah, hopefully. So yeah, Nancy and I are going to be uh, talking to you today about sort of what can be done about fatigue and kidney disease. And I think, you know, Nancy and I each kind of bring a unique uh, perspective to this. Um, as Daisy sort of mentioned, Nancy has lived with kidney disease for many years. Um, and I sort of research fatigue and kidney disease and focus on that. So um, we're kind of, you know, going to share our, our uh, collective ideas with you, uh, best tips and tricks for how to live well uh, in spite of fatigue. So uh, I think, Nancy, you're going to start us off by sort of highlighting some of your experiences with fatigue as a person with kidney disease. Yes, absolutely. So as you heard, um, I have been a patient for 33 years. It was a crash start, which, which was a real shock to the system. And I can tell you that it was that opportunity to use my skills in terms of knowing about uh, fatigue management, um, stress management, pain management, etc. cetera. Um, what I learned was actually applying them was a lot harder than teaching them. And that was a bit of a surprise to me because figuring out how to manage your fatigue, when to say no, when to say yes, did turn out to be a challenge. And I, I really did feel at one point I should call all those patients back that I had taught fatigue management to and apologize because I discovered it was harder than I thought. And yet when I learned it, it was such a strong sense of accomplishment that I was making good decisions that I was able to do more during my day and I was able to uh, take greater part in the things that I had done before. I think equally important is that in my very early days, there was no um, ARINESP or EPREX or any of the red blood cell stimulants. And so the deep fatigue that I experienced was extremely little, little, uh, limiting. Um, however, I was in better physical shape before I started dialysis and I continued walking to work and climbing the stairs. So my physical activity certainly helped. I also recognized that my concentration was really limited and um, I ended up being able to watch programs like Sharon Lois and Brome, 
which was a sing-along children's program that was interesting and entertaining and didn't take too much brain power. So it became very useful to me. Um, and it gives you an idea of where I started and where I am now is completely different. And it has been a learning experience all the way along. And so Janine and I are gonna share some of those experiences to help you find your way. So we'll pass this back. Perfect. So thank you for that, Nancy. So um, I think Nancy's description has kind of uh, highlighted all of the key points that uh, really define fatigue. Um, you know, everybody knows what it feels like to feel tired after a particularly long day, for example, but um, people with kidney disease often experience an unusual, abnormal, or excessive tiredness um, that's often disproportionate or even unrelated to the amount of activity or exertion that they have done. Um, and in addition to these feelings of kind of physical fatigue, um, there are also mental and emotional aspects to fatigue in kidney disease as well. So for example, um, a lot of people report a decreased ability to concentrate and feeling mentally tired after doing a lot of uh, cognitive work. Um, a lot of people feel emotional stress and burnout as well. And so fatigue kind of often encompasses all of these physical, mental, and emotional qualities together. And they all sort of, sort of mesh together to create the experience of fatigue. We know that fatigue is a really common issue in, in uh, kidney disease. So if this is something you're experiencing, you are certainly not alone. Um, some estimates, for example, suggest that about seven out of every 10 people uh, who are on hemodialysis therapy experience fatigue. Um, and it's also very common in earlier stages of kidney disease as well. So um, this is an issue that a lot of people are grappling with. So we just thought we'd spend a couple minutes going over some of the reasons why we believe that people with kidney disease experience fatigue. Um, I think it can be helpful to, to have some sense of sort of what is happening and why it might be happening. So um, first of all, there are the physical causes, sort of the disease related causes. Um, and starting with anemia. So as Nancy kind of alluded to, kidney disease causes a lack of oxygen carrying cells in the blood. Um, which is referred to as anemia. And this reduces the amount of energy that one has available to them. Um, so the body can also find itself in sort of the state of, of sort of long-term inflammation when there's a chronic disease present like chronic kidney disease. Um, and we believe that can contribute to fatigue. Um, there are higher levels of toxins in the blood when the kidneys aren't working quite as well as they should be. Um, and that can contribute to fatigue as well. Nutrition is another factor. It can be challenging for a lot of people with kidney disease because of, of course, trying to meet all these different dietary requirements. Um, and, you know, nutrition is certainly a factor in fatigue. Um, and then there are also some medications that people with kidney disease take, uh, for example, some blood pressure medications and some sleep medications um, that can sometimes uh, contribute to fatigue as well, depending on the situation. So those are the physical causes. Um, then we have mental causes that are also really important for understanding fatigue. Um, so first of all, depression and anxiety are both really common in people with kidney disease. Um, it is very stressful to live with a chronic disease um, as, as I'm sure most of you know. Um, and these are, uh, you know, we consider to be sort of a major factor in fatigue um, in kidney disease. Um, a lot of people with kidney disease have sleep disorders, uh, sleep apnea, restless leg syndrome. There are a lot of things that can get in the way of, of getting a good night's rest. Um, using substances like alcohol and marijuana, we believe, can uh, contribute to or worsen fatigue. And then physical inactivity is also kind of a, a challenge. A lot of patients find it really difficult to stay physically active. Uh, for a lot of different reasons, ironically fatigue being one of them. Um, unfortunately, that can lead to kind of a, a cycle of deconditioning and, and slowly worsening fatigue over time. Uh, then there are treatment related causes. So starting with those related to dialysis specifically, a lot of people experience a spike in fatigue after a hemodialysis session. Um, it's possibly because of blood pressure changes during dialysis or other factors related to the treatment. Uh, not getting enough dialysis can contribute to fatigue. Um, our kidneys, you know, are typically working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So in the gaps between dialysis sessions, there can be a buildup of toxins and fluids in the body that can make people feel uh, just not quite as well and a bit tired. Um, and then self-managing kidney disease and dialysis, I think is another important factor to, uh, to mention. You know, planning complex meals, managing medications, monitoring fluid intake, 
all these things that are, you know, sort of encompassed in kidney disease management are really exhausting. And so I think that contributes to fatigue as well. So kind of the take home message is that there are a lot of different factors uh, that affect, affect fatigue. It's often not one thing only, it's usually many different things. Um, and that's why, you know, learning to tackle fatigue from a few different angles um, is, uh, is kind of what we're gonna advocate for and, and discuss. Um, but before we get uh, into our first strategy, we thought we would do our first uh, poll question. So I don't know if they can bring up that poll question for us. There we go. There we go. So uh, the question is, I let my family know how to support me when I'm tired. And the answers you can give are, I don't know what to tell them. We've discussed this as a family and they know what to do. Or I'm tired of complaining about my fatigue and pretending nothing is wrong. So we'll just give everybody a few minutes to kind of click an answer. Okay, so it looks like we've got uh, a good set of responses. Oh, a couple people are still still working on it. Yeah, just a little bit. Okay, so for the sake of time, we'll move on. So I'm tired of complaining about my fatigue and pretending nothing is wrong. I think that is very relatable and that ties in very well to what Nancy and I are, are going to discuss here next, um, which is um, the first strategy, which is communication. Um, and I'm going to pass over to Nancy because she has some really good insights and tips to share about this. So communication is actually one aspect that is probably not addressed as often as it could be. And the first one is uh, the assumptions we make both as patients and as family members, uh, as well as support group and, and even colleagues at work. And so it's become to my attention that it's really important that we actually start talking to uh, the people around us about what our experience is actually like. And that doesn't mean that you're actually complaining. It means that you're indicating that you're tired, you do need assistance, and what kind of help does that mean? But when it comes directly to family and loved ones and um, significant others, I do think it's worth sitting down and having an honest, open conversation. It doesn't have to be a long one where you're talking about what your experience is on both sides of the fence it's like, so that we actually are able to support each other rather than waiting for people to guess what's going on. I think the next thing that goes so strongly with this is reaching out for help. For instance, when you're this tired, it's hard to do everyday things. And I learned very quickly that having someone help clean my house made a huge difference. I felt better when the house was clean, but it also meant that I had someone coming in and doing that hard physical work that I couldn't do. It also often included folding my laundry and a visit, and that too was very important. So this person learned what I needed as a patient, what I was experiencing, but she also brought her experience and her other world in, and it was a great support and a really good connection. I think with this, and this is something they taught me at work, is I would go in and if I was having a tired day, I'd tell them that, but I also posted that number on the whiteboard at work, which was in the staff room. And it was Nancy's energy quotient and it was on a scale of one to one to 10. And what I loved about it is it meant that um, I might get a surprise coffee if someone dropped it by, or I would make sure that the front desk staff knew to bring the patients to me so I didn't have to go there or a good friend who was a lunch lady, I, that was her name, that she would go and pick up my lunch and bring it back to me. She also turned into a confidant who supported me as I had to make some difficult decisions. So this is where communication is the beginning and an ongoing benefit to supporting the um, how you cope with your fatigue. That's fantastic, Nancy. Thank you for that. And I, I love that sort of tidbit about the whiteboard because I think it's just such a neat way to kind of get around this. So what can be a difficult conversation, right? To continuously be having to bring up fatigue and talk about fatigue and just having a system like that in place where like nobody has to raise it. It's just something that's done. And, um, you know, it gets everybody on the same page in a really easy way, so. Yeah, it really does work well and it saves a lot of complaining. It makes life easier for everybody. Yeah, exactly. So some great tips. Um, so our next uh, strategy is uh, staying active and engaged. Um, and I think this is a really important part of managing fatigue um, because first of all, we know it works. 
Uh, that's what the research suggests. So there was, for example, a recent analysis done, uh, released in 2020, that combined all of the previous study results about physical activity and its impact on energy levels um, in people with kidney disease, both pre-dialysis and people who are on dialysis. Um, and they concluded that you know, physical activity does lead to more energy for both groups. I think uh, this is something that we're all kind of familiar with, but you know, the, the challenge is, um, you know, how do you actually do it? It's, it's overwhelming, right? Um, there, are, there are a lot of barriers that I think people face, uh, fatigue, certainly in kidney disease, uh, other symptoms, um, you know, just not really knowing where to start um, or fear of doing it wrong and actually making things worse. So um, we thought we'd just go over a few basic tips for this. And Nancy, I think you were gonna start with recognizing what you're already doing. This is such a great opportunity to really acknowledge what you're doing right now. We tend to think back to our non-fatigue brain and all those zillion things that we did that we actually forget to acknowledge what we're already doing and what a difference it's actually making. And this literally ranges from getting up in the morning and getting dressed and making a meal to actually going outside for a walk or doing other things that you're enjoying that actually get you up and get you moving. Uh, when you're doing this also, I think it, it helps you realize that everything really does count. There's a tendency to think that a standard exercise program is 30 minutes, five days a week, and your brain goes, are you serious? I can barely clean up after dinner. How in the world am I going to walk for 30 minutes? So by recognizing what you're doing now and recognizing that it is sustaining you and it is supporting you is really, really important. Yeah, so then the second point, increasing activity in small steps builds really nicely off of that. Um, and setting small manageable goals. Nancy, what are your thoughts about this? You know, this is another one that the beauty of it is that it can be easily incorporated into your day. Equally important is spreading it over the whole day so that you're actually supporting your energy as the day goes on. And a really good example is that if you are spending a lot of time sitting, and many of us do, that when you get up to go to the dinner table, that before you actually step out to go to the dinner table, you're going to sit down one more time, get up one more time and go to the dinner table. Well, guess what? You have to sit down to go to, the, to have dinner. So when you get up from dinner, you're going to stand up, sit down one more time, stand again. Now you've already done it twice in one day. And it was just that simple. And it is so good at building lower extremity strength. It's such a neat way of building your endurance without burning yourself out. And you'll see those. This is the other bonus that comes from this is that you'll actually see how you're improving almost on a day to day basis. Um, and that brings us to three. Yeah, that's fantastic. Exactly. And, you know, I think um, as you sort of alluded to, we get wrapped up, I think, including healthcare providers, I think, too, in this like 30 minutes of activity a day, five days a week. And um, you know what, we have to start small, right? And so if it's even just, you know, going outside and going for a walk around your block, like once a week, and that's uh, an increase for you, then that's fantastic. And start there, right? Like that's, that's the message. Increasing in a small step is fantastic. And that's really what we should be aiming for. Yes. Um, and then um, asking the healthcare team for information about exercising uh, to make sure that you have the information that you need uh, to feel confident and comfortable about doing. And I think this is also really important and really fair to do to engage your healthcare uh, team about this. Um, they can also sometimes support you with exercising. Um, you know, sometimes in, in some units, not in all dialysis units or, or uh, you know, kidney care uh, clinics, but uh, some do have structured exercise programs that can be available, or they might be able to point you in the direction of, you know, something out in the community that exists. So um, asking the healthcare team and talking to them about it, I think, is, is a positive step that can be taken as well. So uh, let's do our second poll question here. Perfect. Thank you. So... Uh, the question is, or the statement is, I manage my fatigue by doing everything I can do when I have energy. Is this true for you all the time, some of the time, or you never have a day that you feel energized? Yeah, so it seems like this is a strategy that a lot of people are using at least some of the time, 
some yes, all I... the time just by like kind of riding the waves of energy and kind of going <laughs> for that and that's that's kind of part of the next strategy that I think Nancy and I are going to be talking about um which is um sorry uh, managing our energy. So, um, you know, I think Nancy and I both feel that man energy management um, is, uh, you know, one of the key strategies and skills that can really help people to feel like they're more in control of their fatigue management. So, um, you know, there, there's been a, a study that uh, came out that suggested that people on dialysis have about 50 to 70% of the amount of energy of the expected norm. Um, and I think it can be helpful to put a number on this in some ways, because um, this is kind of your energy budget. This is what you're working with throughout a day. And you have, it's up to you to decide how you're going to spend that energy and what you're going to spend it on and how you're going to allocate it. Um, and so the, the idea of energy management is really about taking the same conscious approach to managing your energy that we often do with managing our money. We budget our money. That's kind of what we're in the habit of doing. And energy can be approached in the same way. And it can be helpful to think about it like that. Um, we often talk about uh, seven key energy saving strategies uh, when we talk about energy management. And uh, these are things that can be helpful for accomplishing things with a little bit more efficiency. Um, so first of all, eliminating a task that's not as important. Nancy, what are your perspectives on this? This is an opportunity to, to really take a look at what jobs or tasks need to be done uh, in your life. And that can be your home, that can be at work, that can be with recreation and play activities. And when you do that, you're going to look at them and think, now, is this something that I have to do? Is someone else can do that for me? Um, a good example is, like I say, cleaning house. And that's when I had a friend that actually volunteered to help clean my house. Um, and it was a task that by eliminating it for me, I saved my energy to spend with her, to spend with social activities I enjoyed, and to avoid spending my energy on a task I actually didn't enjoy much anyway. And that was a big part of that. So being aware that by eliminating. So be really thoughtful about what you're doing and why you're doing it. And maybe who else could do it for you so that you don't have to. Awesome tip. Um, so building on that sort of uh, simplifying tasks can also be really helpful for accomplishing things that maybe you do have to do or even things that you want to do with a little bit more, um, again, efficiency. So um, as an example, you know, setting up automated bill payments with the bank so that you don't have to spend energy thinking about that or even going to the bank to do that. Um, another example, finding simpler recipes to make for din dinner than you might be in the habit of making. Again, it's going to give you the opportunity then to still do that task that maybe is important to you for whatever reason, um, but in a slightly less energy draining way. And so um, thinking of different ways that you can simplify uh, the things that you might you know, want to do or have to do uh, can be another great strategy. Um, so then the third one is using assistive tools that reduce the amount of energy you're expending. So Nancy has a couple of good examples here, I think. Well, this is one that, that where technology, in essence, electricity, can make all the difference in the world. And I think it's a really good idea to find the tools that can make a difference for you. And a couple of really simple ideas is something like using a food processor to chop food. What I discovered was that my food process, processor is actually quite light. And I do live alone, so I get to do everything all the time, but it's also really easy to wash and it saves me a lot of time and energy. Other things are mandolins, that works really well. In the case of the photo where we've got a, la a lady sitting on a tractor stool to garden, this gives her an opportunity to get close to her work. It's easy to get up and down from. It saves her the energy of climbing up and down. And actually, although you can't see it, you can get them with pockets and stuff to put your tools in. So the idea is using technology to support you so that you're not burning off energy you don't have. So um, the fourth point is organizing uh, the, the environment, your home environment, your work environment, um, you know, organizing a room, a drawer, a closet um, in your house or your workspace. Um, it, that, it can make such a difference and make it so much easier to accomplish things and, and much less energy draining, I think both physically and, and mentally as well. Um, and so, you know, it can be worth, you know, investing some of your energy and in, in taking on a little bit of organization within your home environment to figure out how you can make things as efficient as possible to support you in your day to day life so that then you can carry on and um, just free up a little bit more of your energy for, for other things. 
um, asking for assistance. Nancy, what is your perspective on this? Oh, you know, this is one that actually has multiple levels to it. Um, I did mention before that when we talk to other people, when we ask for assistance, it actually does help them to understand our disease better and we can avoid some of that. They don't understand me. They don't know what I need. And the onus on us is to reach out for help. And the key is most people, when they say, is there anything I can do? They're serious. They do want to help, including family and friends who would really like to make your life better. They literally don't know how. So by reaching out and a really good way to include anybody, whether they're family or not, is what do you actually need done? What is that job? For example, I lived in a two-story home with, vac with, um, with vacuum, with carpets. And so by having my friend come over and vacuum, I would tell her that I needed my house vacuumed, that I needed, uh, it would take them 45 minutes, it used to take me way longer than that, um, and that it was two stories, and that they were welcome to stay afterwards and visit or not. And the key point behind that is nobody wants to feel trapped into that three hour visit they weren't planning on. And so we get that visit, we get someone to talk to, we get the job done that is hard for us. And we also get people understanding where we're coming from. So this is an absolutely vital and important way of supporting yourself. Awesome. Um, and then the final two strategies. So repositioning, um, I think the, the tractor school is a, is a great sort of visual depiction of this. Um, it can be a small change that can make a big difference. You know, sitting on a stool while you're chopping the vegetables, sitting on a stool while you're sorting your laundry. Um, it's often not intuitive for us to, to do these things, but actually they're, they're pretty simple changes and they can certainly make a difference in, in how draining something is. Um, and then finally, slowing down and pacing yourself. You know, on higher energy days, um, as we sort of touched on in the poll question, sometimes it can be tempting to try to accomplish a lot. Um, if you're feeling good, you want to sort of ride that high and get everything in. Um, then the problem is that that can actually wear you out over the next couple of days and lead to a real crash. And so, um, you know, breaking things up, spreading things out throughout the week, you know, doing just one room of the house cleaning instead of trying to do all in one day. Um, these things can be really helpful as well. So the good news is that this approach has, has actually been found to be helpful in research. This is what I research. And um, we found that people who completed uh, an energy management program um, went on to accomplish 65% of activity goals that they had set. So things like you know wanting to be able to uh, shower independently or visit with a friend, um, compared to just 22% achieved their goals in, the, in a control group. So uh, this is an evidence-based approach as well. So our next sort of uh, meta strategy is reframing your thinking. I think this can also be really helpful for um, reducing negative thoughts and emotions that often come with the physical symptom of fatigue. So sometimes uh, people experience a physical symptom like fatigue um, and it can lead to a variety of course of thoughts, feelings, emotions, frustration, all of those things um, that can make that experience even worse. Um, we've all sort of, you know, we can all conjure up times in our lives where this has happened to us. Um, I think Nancy has, a, has a, a couple of good examples to share here. Yeah, this is one that, that your, your self-talk or the way you think makes such a big difference, not only in how you feel, but also in how you cope. And I was given some of the best advice I've ever had from a close friend I had phoned. I was going through a rough time. I was unhappy. I was crying. And her comment was to me that, first of all, give yourself permission to feel whatever you're feeling. It's okay to have negative thoughts. It's okay to be sad. It's also okay to be happy and productive. And learning to actually live my emotions is what made the difference. So instead of fighting back and resisting them, I gave my pers myself permission to feel what I was feeling, lived it, and in a short period of time, I'd be moving on to something else. And it is something that I've taught many times to many people. And they've had such a good result from it because you're no longer fighting what you feel. And you are able to reframe and rewrite those negative thoughts into a positive thought. So what's the benefit of being tired? Well, it's telling you you don't have a lot of energy. So this is a good time to sit down and read a book or to phone a friend instead of sitting on the computer. So it gives you opportunities if you can see them. And that's what reframing is all about. Um, and it's something I'd strongly suggest that people consider. Yeah, and you know, there can be uh, support that you can receive in doing this as well. You know, it's fair to uh, discuss with your healthcare team 
um, ask your social worker if there are any programs that you can be hooked up to. Um, psychotherapies are sort of a structured way of kind of learning uh, some of these reframing skills. Um, and so it's fair to kind of bring that up with your healthcare team and sort of see what's available to you. So um, getting enough sleep is our next uh, strategy. Um, and I think there are some concrete things that uh, we can all do to increase the likelihood of, of sleeping well. So we'll just go over a few examples. Um, so limiting daytime naps to 30 minutes. Um, and this increases the likelihood that you're gonna be actually tired at night and will be able to sleep at night. Um, avoiding stimulants like caffeine and nicotine before bed. Um, obviously, you know, not having a cup of coffee before bed, that seems intuitive, but um, I think it can, you know, it can make a difference. Um, exercising during the day so that you're feeling tired at night. This is another sort of benefit of, of getting a little bit more physical activity during the day is that it can, you know, increase the likelihood that you're going to be sort of tired and sleep when you, when you lie down. Um, avoiding heavier rich foods before bed. Um, you know, I think this can increase uh, the quality of one's sleep as well. Getting adequate exposure to natural light during the day um, can sort of reinforce our circadian rhythms and get us into um, sort of a mode of sleep at night. Um, and then establishing a regular uh, relaxing bedtime routine and making the bedroom pleasant, um, you know, making it a, an environment that you enjoy and want to be in and is relaxing. Um, is helpful as well. And then Nancy is going to talk a little bit, bit about being restful, even if you're not sleeping, which I think is also a great idea. And I really like the way this one's phrased, because the idea behind it is that it's nighttime, um, you want to be sleeping. And although lots of instructions say if you're not sleeping in 15 minutes, get up. Well, that can be done. The key behind that, at least for me, is to avoid all screen time. So no TV, no computer, no phone, uh, not even a Kobo or an e-reader. Uh, that's when music comes into play or the radio, uh, reading a paper book or what I call a real book so that you're not you're avoiding any screen time or even a talking book is a good idea, the audible books. And the whole idea is to keep yourself calm, keep yourself warm and just re literally relax and be restful even if you're not asleep. And what I love about it is that your body does rest and you actually might find yourself falling asleep and that's okay too. Um, so it's something to really consider when you're getting up because you can't sleep, avoid cleaning the kitchen and doing the laundry because that does wake you up and that's what we're trying to avoid. Absolutely. So um, following your diet and medications as best you can is our next strategy and um, you know I think this can be helpful for preventing you know complicating factors like fluid overload, um, you know a lack of nutrition, other symptoms that can contribute to fatigue that might happen if you're if you're not um, uh, taking meds uh, as prescribed or uh, following the diet uh, quite as it's prescribed. Um, and Nancy, what has been your experience with diet and medications? For me, I learned, especially when I went to hemodialysis, that in order to make my dialysis more comfortable, following my diets and sticking to my fluids really, really helped. And actually, the other thing that helped was doing things one at a time, because diet's huge to change and certainly overwhelming. So I started with salt. And that actually helped me manage my fluids as well. And then I gradually make more changes as I was getting more adapted to the diet. And what I loved about it is I got all these aha and accomplishments from each step that I took. And it did improve my dialysis, so it wasn't as stressful. But also taking meds as on time and as appropriate make a really big difference because they're prescribed to you for a reason. And if we optimize their use and their function, the better the results are. Um, so I really think that the two of them go hand in hand to improving the, our energy management. Absolutely. And of course, if you're experiencing challenges, this, that's totally normal. There's so much to keep track of when you're managing a, a chronic illness like a kidney disease. So, you know, it's fair to ask for support from, you know, your dietitian, social worker, and occupational therapist, if they're available to you, who might be able to help you address some barriers that you might be facing and come up with strategies together. And then uh, minimizing stress is our final one. I think it's a big one. So Nancy, what has been your experience with uh, managing stress? Oh man, actually this is another one. And as said that managing energy is the components all pulled together. And stress is a really big one that chews up a lot of energy. Uh, and one of them is looking at what's going on in your life and what can you fix to reduce that stress. So it's not just doing 
although meditation and deep breathing really help with the symptoms of stress, it's dealing with the actual topic. In my case, I can tell you, and I learned this from my dad, that being early to events was really important. And the reason it's important is it takes that stress off of fighting the traffic, finding parking, then getting to the building. How far do you have to walk? What have you got? Your coat and your boots and all that. So I'm the type that prepares early and I love it because then if things go wrong, like the alarm clock doesn't go off, I'm still not late. I just grab my stuff and go. So prepare the night before or in time before. Plan to leave early and then arrive early. And that means that you can read that book that you haven't had time for, or you can visit with your driver. I don't drive. So to me, that's a great connection. Or it might be that you get to actually visit with somebody else in the waiting room when the doors open again. So stress, managing your stress can be magical in releasing energy that you've tied up in something that doesn't have to be tied up in. Exactly. Right. And just to add, uh, stress management can look different for different people too. There's going to be, you know, you have to find the strategy that works for you. And um, you know, as Nancy mentioned, sometimes it's meditation, sometimes it's getting out in nature, reading a book, connecting with a friend, uh, being able to talk things out, um, you know, exploring what can alleviate some of that sort of emotional burden um, of living with kidney disease. So that's it for us. We hope some of these tips have been helpful. Um, again, I think our overall message is that it might not be one strategy that's going to solve your fatigue and make it go away. But I think if you combine these strategies, um, we hope you find you're able to, to sort of find your stride a little bit more with, uh, with managing fatigue. And uh, so we'd be happy to uh, take a couple of questions now. Nancy and Janine, thank you so much for sharing your expertise in the area of fatigue and kidney disease. Um, yes, we'll now move on to some audience questions. So the first one that I have popping up is Loretta would like to know if we have an energy management program. Yeah, so that's a, a great question. Uh, I'll also let Nancy touch on this because Nancy's also an expert in this. But um, the answer is that I feel like there's not one consistent answer that I can give that will apply to everybody who's here. Um, you know, uh, we are working on sort of developing a program that can be sort of implemented across dialysis units or kidney programs. Um, that is not ready yet, um, but I think there are still some programs that do have some educational information that they can give you about energy management. And so I think it's, it's you know, a good idea always to ask your team um, what they can provide um, with respect to that in your specific setting. And Nancy, I don't know if you, have, you want to add anything there. Yeah, it's actually uh, something I've been looking for from the very beginning because there is no rehab or very little rehab across country in kidney disease in particular, right from CKD on. Um, it is something that I've been in discussion with with uh, the Edmonton North crew for the Kidney Foundation, as I would love to be a part of something like that. So I hope if people keep asking for it, that we might be able to make it happen, not to mention a little bit of money behind that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, that's absolutely right. I agree. So if it's something you're interested in, ask your healthcare team because it, it, it's important for them to know as well that it's something that, you know, people want and want to have available to them, I think. So yeah. that's a great point, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janine and Nancy. Uh, another question. Um, this one is for Nancy. So you brought up the need to ask for help because your friends and family want to help. And so what advice would you provide to someone who might be apprehensive in asking for the support? Um. First of all, you might want to do a, a brief inventory of who in your life has said, do you need anything? Can I help you? Um, and start with those people. And once you recognize that people are offering, then you'll find that it'll get easier to do. And like I say, when you have it, uh, what, what's the job that needs to be done? How long does it need to, how long will it take? Even when does it need to be done? Um, that will really help you because people that are helping want to know those kind of details and it takes the stress off of both of you. Uh, and once you've done that, you'll find that, that you can set this up and uh, they might do things on a regular to a weekly basis or something like that. Um, and, and again, that also builds that social connection. It builds your network and it'll build your support network as well. Um, I hope that answers the question. If there's more, we can try later. Thank you, Nancy. Um, Linda commented and she said that she feels very fatigued after eating and especially after consuming protein. So to avoid the need for an after meal nap, um, she's been 
oh, my apologies, starting to eat just kidney friendly fruits and vegetables, which uh, she indicated may not be a great solution. So she's wondering, do you have any better solutions or suggestions? All right, Nancy, go ahead. Um, okay, um, my first thought is, is looking at um, what else you're eating with that protein. So finding a balance um, of fruits and vegetables because a protein is one of the things that our bodies definitely require. And you know what? The other thing to think about is that in managing our energy, we often need to take a rest slash nap a couple times a day. And so often after a meal is a common time when at least I need them. And you can set that alarm and set it for 10 minutes to 30 minutes and let your body rest because that's what you need. Making sure that you are eating well and eating well balanced so that you're not depriving yourself of anything. So you could also break it up into smaller meals where you're having smaller amounts of protein through the day. That can help avoid the nap while you're at it. Great tips. Fantastic. Um, another question is, so in situations where um, you, you've told your friends that you're not wanting to go out for a social outing because of fatigue. Um, there are some concerns that perhaps your social network may then stop calling because they assume that you will just say no. And so I'm wondering, um, Nancy, if you could speak to that. Actually, yes, thank you. That's an excellent question. And it's a really uh, appropriate concern because when you say no too often, people aren't gonna call. The answer to that one is, is invite them over and they can bring the party with them. And you can even set boundaries that says, you know what, how about you come here because I am too tired to go out tonight and we'll go for half an hour here and then you're on your way. So you still have that connection. You've drawn your boundaries so you're not exhausted at the end, but you're also including them in your life. Um, another thing to do is look at doing smaller activities or an activity where you can actually sit during that time or walk for a bit and then rest. And it's a system that's worked really well for me that, that if I decide to go for a walk with friends or even a better one is I went snowshoeing uh, this winter, which I loved and the friend I snowshoed with, I'd say, okay, I need a rest and she'd keep on moving. And then when I was ready to go, we'd go again. And it was really neat because she got her exercise and I got mine, but I wasn't totally exhausted at the time. And including them, setting your boundaries and sticking to them really and truly work. Mm -hmm. and, and I have done the thing where I invite a few friends in. So it might be two friends instead of six. And we'll have um, a visit that might be half an hour, an hour. And those kind of things really work at keeping that social work network connected. Yeah, absolutely. And I just, uh, what comes to mind for me is, um, you know, the ener energy management strategy of simplifying. Um, again, as Nancy kind of touched on, I think um, sometimes the solution involves sort of reimagining how you, how you might normally do things. And so it's asking yourself, how can I still connect with my group? And how can I, how can I, um, you know, see them without spending as much energy as I normally do? Because obviously what's being done is it feels too, too tiring. It's, uh, it's draining too much of your energy. And so what is a different way to do that? And Nancy's suggestion of having people over to your place instead, maybe uh, ordering takeout instead of, you know, ha you having to prepare, you know, food for them, um, you know, doing the house cleaning the day before rather than doing it on the day of all of these little sort of things again that, you know, you're analyzing how can I cut back on this so that this actually feels manageable to me. And then of course, using some of the communication strategies that we talked about as well um, are important because you have to kind of be comfortable to sort of be honest with the people who are in your social circle and kind of let them know what's going on so that they can support you. Thank you. And so I believe we have time for one more question. And so um, the pres presentation provided tips for better sleep. And one of the tips suggested uh, limited your naps to 30 minutes. And so what would you say to people who perhaps are just too tired, um, perhaps because of dialysis, and they're unable to limit their naps to that time frame? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think, um, obviously, your body is going to tell you on some level, um, you know, when you desperately need sleep. And I think it's important to certainly listen to that. Um, but sometimes a shorter nap can actually do the trick, um, even when you think uh, that you might need a much longer one. And so um, it's kind of finding that balance, I think, right? Like, um, you know, if you feel like you just want to sleep for the whole rest of the night, say your alarms for like 45 minutes and just do that 45 minutes or just do an hour. Um, and then kind of, you know, force yourself to get up the way you would normally force yourself to get up if you've got to, you know, go somewhere in the morning. 
Um, and then again, that's going to benefit you because you will get them to sleep at night. So it's not like you'll be, um, you know, debilitated and exhausted for the, you know, um, for the long term. You'll actually be improving your sort of sleep schedule. And so I think it's it's a little bit of just kind of um, finding the right balance of how much you have to nap versus how much um, perhaps you can sort of give up and 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 uh, challenge yourself to do a little bit less. I don't know, Nancy, if you want to add anything there. Yeah, the other, and I think that's brilliant because the other addition to that is that getting up and moving, the tendency to stay in one place just adds to that, that mm -hmm. pers persistent in napping. Whereas you get up even to, you know, walk to the end of the hall or go outside and enjoy some sunshine, uh, putting on a coat makes a big difference. And, and those can actually um, support the energy that you can gain from movement and reduce some of the napping as well so that you are sleeping at night. And that might be your exercise for the day is putting that coat on and going outside of the mailbox. Mm -hmm. So it can balance that nap with activity. Well, thank you so much, Nancy and Janine, um, for your excellent presentation on managing fatigue as a kidney patient and to all of those who submitted questions. Uh, if you have any further questions about this or any of our patient forum sessions, please reach out to your regional kidney foundation branch office uh, through our website, kidney.ca, or send us an email at kidneyprograms at kidney.ca or programs at rain.ca. <laughs>